Hey team, this is the Innovation Inc. podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Brown Evans. We sit down with our favorite entrepreneurs and nerd out on anything that involves innovation in the corporate space. So if you work for a corporate company, but you think like an entrepreneur, we're your people, and we're really excited you're here. Before we jump in, a huge thank you to our sponsor and Inc. 5000 company, APAC Software. They create powerful custom software, websites, and mobile apps that take your business's innovative ideas and turn them into realities. Reach out today to get a quote at apacsoftware.com. All right, everyone, let's get to it. Welcome, everyone, back to the Innovation Incubated podcast series. As you guys hopefully know at this point, I'm Liz Brown Evans. Um, and I, I'm really excited about today. We are here to talk about corporate innovation, really dig into what that looks like. What does it look like for a company to be innovative and creative? And we've got a big treat in store for you guys today. So really quick before I get into that, for those who are listening, um, if you think we should interview you or you think we should interview a very smart colleague of yours, please reach out to us. We are building our um, our sort of bullpen for the year of uh, guest interviews. So reach out to us. We would love to hear from that. So today I'm both honored and very excited to, to introduce you to our guest. I'm going to take a little bit longer than normal for both Ms. D and David's intros because I want our audience to have the context that I have that's made me so excited for today. So today we have with us Ms. D. Wrigley Miller and David Bertram of Wrigley Media Group located here in Lexington, actually downtown, I believe right off Newtown Pike. Is that correct? Not too far away. Um, so Ms. D. is the CEO and owner of Wrigley Media Group. David is the CRO of Wrigley Media Group. Ms. D., to say you have an impressive bio is an understatement, but I want to highlight a few of my favorites, which may or may not be relevant to the conversation today, but you You've won numerous telly awards in journalism and reporting, gold medals at the World Equestrian Games as recent as 2018, which blew my mind. You are one of the few people in the world that Prince Phillips allowed to interview him after announcing he was retiring from his royal duties. I love that you included those into your bio because... They just gave me a great context for, I think, how versatile and just interesting of a person you are. So very excited to hear from you. And then, David, following with your start with host communications, as I understand, your career includes leading IMG College National Collegiate Properties Division and serving as executive director of NCAA football. So to summarize for our local listeners, he's a Kentucky guy, he's a sports guy, and he's a media guy. That's pretty much all we care about in the state. Maybe bourbon, but maybe you, I would assume you're also a bourbon guy uh, at times. So I'm particularly excited to have you guys both on together. Um, just to have the owner, the founder, CEO's perspective, or CEO's perspective, and then also a fresh set of executive eyes. It sounds like David, I believe, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, you came on in 2020. So um, I'm going to stop there and do a quick intro for those who aren't familiar with Wrigley Media. If you aren't, shame on you. Um, but they are a very versatile media um, company here in town. It sounds like you guys do all sorts of content, social media, you do TV shows, you guys do 3D innovation, CG work, visual effects, you name it, they do it all under one roof. So Mizzy and David, I think that was my longest intro ever to date. I'm going to pass it off to you guys. Fill us in some of the blanks of anything else you guys want people to know about yourselves or about Wrigley, and then we'll uh, get into some of our questions. Well, honestly, Liz, you you summed it up pretty well. Um, we do. We we do short form, long form, any form of, of content, anything that our clients need and our clients range um, from manufacturers to uh, happily television networks now. So we are constantly pivoting and, and keeping up with, you know, the, the innovations in the industry to keep ourselves current, not, not only current, but keep uh, ahead of the curve in a very, very innovative industry. I think the only thing I would add, Liz, is, is really highlight the fact that we are based here in Lexington. Um, we do a tremendous amount of work locally, but we are we have and we continue to do a lot of work nationally as well. But we all adore Lexington. Um, me personally, I've been fortunate to be able to work in, in the industries you've you've mentioned and all right here. Um, I love it here. We want to build, continue to build something very special here and it can be done. You know, it's, we don't have to be in Hollywood or New York or, or a major, major market to do the things we're doing. And we've, we, we knew we could do it, but we certainly proved it over the last 18 months with, you know, working remotely and all those types of things. So we can't, could not be more proud to be based in Lexington, in Kentucky and doing, you know, 
what we think is world-class work right from here. So I was going to say this question for a little bit later, but one, some might say Kentucky isn't on the leading innovative edge. I don't know that we're a media hub in the perception internationally or nationally. Maybe I'm wrong. And here you guys are. Is that perception wrong or are you guys changing that? Is that what Wrigley is actively out to do? We are actively out to change that perception. And we got uh, two big um, boosts. One was when we landed um, a a nationally syndicated television show, uh, Relative Justice, which we can speak a a lot more on later. And secondly, when um, the state legislature passed the film tax incentive credits, which will allow us to be on the the same level playing field with other um, media centers such as Atlanta, LA, New York. And, you know, given given that choice, who wouldn't want to be producing great media in Lexington? And we really believe it, you know, it's the field of dreams. if we build this industry, people will come. And it is my dream, and I think everyone on the Wrigley team's dream, to make um, Lexington and Kentucky known for horses, bourbon, and the film industry. So, David, I'm going to direct this question toward you mostly because, Ms. Z, I'm going to disqualify you since you've been around for so long. What does corporate innovation look like currently at Wrigley? And I, I'm curious your perspective as someone who's newer, getting your hands around the business, around employees and culture. Sure. Um, I think the, like any great organization, it, it, it's people, first and foremost. So there's a rich heritage at Wrigley going back to when it was post-time productions and post-time studios. And then when MISD, uh, you know, acquired it and we changed the name and, and we're very obvious reasons. Her name uh, carries a lot of uh, cachet around the country and around the globe, and that was incredibly helpful. But boiling it back down, the the legacy people that are there continue um, to do great work, and through you know, in through Misty's leadership as well as we need to acknowledge our late CEO Jane Hancock, um, who who passed. Um, Gosh, now it's been several months, almost a year, I guess. Um, She really did a great job of bringing in people from around the country. And it was not a hard sell. Again, going back to the attractiveness of of Central Kentucky and getting out of, you know, the rat race and the hour and a half commutes in L.A. or Washington, D.C. or whatever the case may be. So getting back to the innovation, I think it is bringing people with different perspectives, um, different contacts and different experiences to come together and, you know, cooperate and try to build great things. You know, in terms of other innovative things, we've got top of the line facilities, we've got top of the line equipment, um, but I will still go back to our people. We've got just amazing people that are super energized to do what we do every day. If we've learned anything talking to companies about corporate innovation, it's that it, the success or failure of it, is contingent on people and culture. Um, So from the research I've done asking around and and reading more on you guys, I think it is obvious you guys are known as creative, as pushing sort of the leading edge of what media is going to look like. One thing I've been impressed by is the decision to diversify your offerings and do so much in-house, which I think I would assume not only is innovative, but also a smart decision from giving yourselves lots of ways to survive in different times, namely last year. Um, Mizzy, how did, was that something that happened organically over time? Was that a, a strong strategic decision to to do so much in-house and diversify what you guys can offer clients? It was definitely a strategic decision. And part of building on, on what David said um, about the vision of um, Jane before she passed was she was able to identify and hire specialists, so many talented people, so we could address all of those um, different media platforms and allow us to diversify and, and as I mentioned before, stay, stay ahead of the curve of media innovation so we could offer products 
to our clients to make them stand out. I mean, there's so much content across so many platforms these days that we have to be able to make our clients really stand out and, and let their voices be heard. So enable uh, to be able to do that, we have to be able to um, address all of those platforms and mediums. Mizzy, another question for you, and it and it relates to again, you guys having this diverse portfolio. What what has been your disposition toward risk as a company? Um, from what I understand, and you know, spoiler, we do a little bit of background work and prep work. You you guys have taken on a lot of um, risk in a sense with uh, a court show. If you want to tell us a little bit about that, that you got on on ownership on the front end and really believing in this project. So I would love to hear about that. But even from a broader scale, what is what does risk look like for a company at, at Wrigley? If you are involved in um, in a media company that uh, is constantly being innovative, you have to be uh, extremely risk tolerant and and able and ready to to you know take on that risk. Um, it's definitely not a business for the faint of heart, and I've learned that um, several times over the <laughs> the last couple of years, especially. Um, so, I have been given um, such an an amazing group of of people. My team is um, I, I call them as David knows. They're my knights of the round table. <laughs> and they give me a lot of strength and the courage to go into battle, knowing that we're going to win some major wars going forward and, and wars in the, the sense of building a major media company, a media center right here in central Kentucky. So talk to us. I would love to hear a little bit more um, to get into a specific project you guys are working on. You guys are doing a little bit of court TV. You've, you've built a facility, as I understand, um, and I'm happy for either of you to speak to that. But what is that? Um, that's something I assume you guys are proud to do here in the area. Um, how did that decision happen and, and what does the future of that project look like? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and, and David, you can uh, follow, follow me up. Um, it, Doing a syndicated program has been sort of in the, the back boilerplate for a couple of years. And we were just looking for sort of the, the right mix of, of talent and timing. Um, and we were so happy that about a year ago, um, we shot a sizzle with a very, very talented attorney. And, um, and she just clicked. And the concept, relative justice, was taking the, the family argument from the dining room to the courtroom. And in a perfect storm of timing, um, Judge Judy now is, has gone off of um, network television and three other very popular court shows have gone off the air. So there was sort of a void in this very, very popular um, television um, show. Uh, format. And we had a very talented, talented group of people putting together this show that um, we were able to sell, uh, syndicate across, um, I think, uh, I think we're in now sold in 46 of the top 50 markets. And, you know, it's, <laughs> you're you're putting yourself out there. Syndication is not for the faint of heart. Hmm. So if I hadn't been backed up by a tremendous team, we have such great veterans working on this show. Um, our showrunner Lou Denig has done over, I think, 4,800 court shows, um, including um, Judge Judy and Judge Joe Brown. Our director um, is also well versed in in directing court shows so we were able to bring in this veteran fantastic group of of uh, people to build this show so we're excited and then um david is partially responsible for selling me in the, the on the theater concept um so uh, i'll toss it to you david <laughs> with why sure. we moved to where where we're filming this now Sure. I think a lot of, of people will, you know, they're certainly familiar with Woodhill Center um, in the Woodhill community. Um, the, the Cinemark Theater that has been uh, vacant for about six years 
um, became available or was available, but we identified it as a possible solution because we needed very tall ceilings and able to soundproof and do all those things. The, the beautiful thing about that theater, our theaters, there, are 10, there were 10 screens in the theater, it, um, the entire complex, and <clears throat> it was already soundproofed because it was a movie theater. So that was a huge win. And the ceilings were so tall that it automatically, you know, fit the bill. The only real um, mat material adjustment we had to do in the renovation was to level out the, uh, the floors because the floors were sloped because it was set up as obviously as a theater for seating. And once that was done, you just have an enormous box and it was exactly what we needed. And it was just an added benefit that the air conditioning system uh, the roof, all those things were already equipped for, for our needs. Um, so it's, and it's great that that community, the Wood Hill community is such an interesting mix of people. And our goal is to do much, much more than just shoot a television show there. It is to hopefully engage with the community and do some, some things with the, the Wood Hill community center right across the street. Um, back way back when they used to use that theater, kids used to go over there and watch, watch movies. Now, they, maybe they can come over and, and watch a television show. So, <laughs> so are, you, are you looking for a live audience? Because that I'm sure that would be fascinating. We do, but you have to be 18. <laughs> David, talk to me a little bit more. Well, I'll say this. So one of the things that we do a lot and also coach a lot at companies is that to have a new idea, it does not have to be fully fleshed out. You have a whole budget and you fire this big old cannonball. You can fire bullets as is often called in the business world to try things and test things quickly. And I think what is interesting to me about this theater is you guys didn't take a whole building and renovate the entire thing and try six new projects and do it all at one time. You've used the rooms that you need and you're doing what you need to do for right now with the opportunity to see how it goes and then expand. And I love sort of the the narrative and the analogy for what um, cautious but still tr strategic innovation can look like over time. So I'm curious, do you guys have thoughts for the building as you guys move forward? Is this sort of we'll see how this goes and then move beyond however many rooms you're using right now? The wonderful thing is no one else is going to be coming into that facility because that would be problematic, obviously, if if someone came in and it was a warehousing company and they were running forklifts through there, that would not work. So we've got time to decide what to do with the rest of it. I think in a perfect world, several more of those individual theaters would be converted into sound stages where we could have multiple productions going at once. There's plenty of room as well for um, office space, which we need right now. We, if you if you've been, please, you, we we would love to have you come if you've not been yet. But there's right now there's there's a bunch of tables set up. It's a a bullpen, and th that would be nice to have that more as a traditional structured office environment. But it's working very very well right now. And then there's there's one um, one theater that's been left. Uh, the the floor has been left, and it could potentially become a theater again. And I'm going to let Misty talk about that. We do have a long-term vision for that building. And uh, part of that vision is recreating a, a very special space in for me. Um, and that is recreating the Avalon Theater on Catalina Island. If anyone has ever been there, it's one of the most beautiful theaters in the world. And I would love to recreate it in, in that space and it'll be used in the future, not only for premieres, but uh, to host events and um, charity events and, uh, you know, and, and really use that building for the, for the community, open it up, not just to media production, but to be a real part of the community and, uh, just because it's important to me that Wrigley Media is not just a successful media company, but it is a successful community leader and partner. I think this may be a good time to talk through, you guys did a lot of community partner work for good, especially in the last year. It was a hard year for companies across the board. And you guys chose to spend that time uh, intentionally from what I understand and very generously. Um, so maybe Ms. D, I'll start with you. What, what, how did you guys choose to spend company time, energy and effort and benevolence throughout 
throughout 2020 and really into this year as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back a little bit um, to something that I, I was taught at a very young age, and that is um, to those who have been given much, much is expected. And when COVID really started shutting things down, I realized that we had the means in many different ways to really step up and help our community. And so we reached out, especially to the nonprofits who of course were so um, hard hit by not being able to, to have their annual gala fundraisers and create virtual events for them and uh, get their messages out on, on, on social media. And it was also important for our team and, and unique to our business is that because of our um, setup, our editors were able to work from home, which was a, a huge advantage. And, um, and I think gave our team um, something really to, to look forward to, to keep them working, to keep them feeling positive. And um, one of the, I'll, I'll end up one of the, the things that we ended up doing, which I, I think really helped was I challenged them to find, because as you know, there were all kinds of um, social posts and, and some of them were very amusing across around the country. So I challenged them to find like their top five favorite posts. And at the end of the week, um, we, we would play them. And what really struck me um, and, you know, just for a little bit of levity and humor, make us all smile. And it, it struck me um, about the, the resilience of America during that time of uh, American people and their sense of, of humanity and their ability to maintain a sense of humor, even in the um, in the wake of, you know, terrible despair and, and tragedy for what was happening in our country. Yes, and amen. I think if anything, social media, I, I don't know if you guys are on TikTok. Hopefully you are. You're media people. You need, you need to have some sort of a pulse on something. But my mom always asks me, A, what is it? Which I've explained a few times. I love you, mom. And then B, <laughs> why am I on it? And I truly, I don't know how else to say it other than TikTok gave me, I think, probably my top five hardest laughs of 2020. And I don't even have a full account, you know, but it, um, I think it does just show the capacity for humans, I, I just feel like it's put human creativity on, on at the forefront on blast, if you will, because it, you know, it makes essentially video editing accessible to your average, your average person. So, um, I resonate a lot with that. And I, what a, what a beautiful thing to do as a leader too, to remind people, it sounds like on a weekly basis, we can find humor and, and a little bit of joy and in, in what was obviously a hard year for everyone. Um, so speaking of COVID and, and I don't want to, um, dismiss the gravity of COVID. But in a sense, COVID is also a, I think it has shown us a lot of trends that are coming forward, such as remote work, people engaging with media, um, engaging with a lot of things very differently. Um, David, um, hopefully this isn't too much of a jump, but to switch a little bit into the trend category, um, how, how are you, what, what do you see on the forefront, whether that's, um, uh, I'll go ahead and show some of my cards. I know esports is a big thing that you guys are looking at. Different ways that people are engaging with media, which I do think has changed a lot in the last few years. Um, what what is Wrigley focusing on? Maybe both from just an interesting research perspective, or from a strategic perspective, as far as where you guys see trends going in the media industry. Sure. Well, you hit you hit the one the, the first one with TikTok. Um, social media is absolutely at our at the forefront for us. We are finding we we whenever we do projects, typically for our client work, typically we will do cut downs or we will be thinking about what we're going to do with this content from a social media perspective. And now that ratio of it being traditional, you know, uh, resolution and that's that's starting to to change because we're doing a lot of work now that is solely specifically social media driven and. That then also then comes into play. Okay, when you're talking TikTok, you're talking you know a much younger demographic. You you can't trick anyone. Those days are over. Nobody. We don't think like that. We think of how can we bring relevant content 
and that we are just laying it out there. Here's what we're trying to tell you. Hopefully you watch it and hopefully there's an actionable item or action that's taken. So we're very, very sensitive to that. Um, you know, our goal is to help people reach as many people in their targeted audience as possible. So you have to go to where you get a fish where the fish are, so to speak. So from that perspective, it's social media uh, is always at the top of our mind in every conversation. Now you talked about esports. Yes, that's another one where that's a much younger uh, demographic. But for those of us that uh, grew up with Ataris and, uh, and televisions, <laughs> um, we have to we had to quickly understand that space. And so we do a lot of work with UK in their esports program. Um, we've got some other exciting projects that uh, can't get too deep into right now, but we know that that is uh, here to stay. Um, it's very hard for people uh, older than, you know, probably 35, 40 to really understand how do people get paid to play video games, but they do and they get paid a lot. And so it's an, an enormous, enormous opportunity. And I think we would be uh, really missing the mark if we weren't paying attention to it, if we're trying to do what we're, you know, which we are trying to do is be, be a major media player in, 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 the, in the country. So esports, absolutely. Um, we, with my background and working in university and college sports, um, great opportunities around universities. We've got a very robust partnership with UK, but we do a lot of other work around the country. Um, JMI Sports, who is UK's multimedia rights holder, uh, has several properties that we would welcome the opportunity to do work with them. Um, we do work with Transylvania University, uh, which, you know, very, I would, I would say non-competitive to UK in the work that we do there. Uh, we're very sensitive to that uh, in any of the work that we do, that we don't want to step on toes and uh, uh, offend or, you know, have the appearance that there is a conflict. If, if we're trying to help UK get students, then, you know, it would be counterintuitive for us to go help, you know, a school maybe, you know, down the road in Louisville to try to do the same thing. So, those are the type of things that, that we're thinking uh, all the time in being sensitive to our to our clients. Um, you know, in sports marketing in general, we everybody needs content. And one of the really interesting things we've done recently was a company out of Cleveland. Um, it is the company that manufactures the sideline benches for the NFL, the heated benches that you see uh, in you know in Soldier Field, Lambeau Field, whatever the case may be. Well, they created a new product that is air conditioned because they were just selling their product to NFL teams in, in the Northern part of the country. So they, they came to us through, you know, long time relationship and we went to Cleveland and shot their new bench. And all of a sudden they are going to be in every stadium in the NFL. And they're also going into colleges as well. So they hadn't even done video before this. And now we have, and, and I would encourage you to, to see that, that spot. It's called Dragon Seats. And it, that was a great, fun project. But it was one of those things where it just, it really just came around organically. Uh, interestingly, the, the dad created, invented the product, but then the son who just came out of, you know, Columbia Business School. That's cool. Said, hey, dad, we need to do this. And so, you know, the rest is history and they're dominating the market now. Um, so those are a few, a few of the things that, that we focus on every day. Um, it's, it's, you know, what, you know, you know, what you're comfortable with. And for me, sports is, is easy. It's where my, my contact list is pretty deep in that area. So I spend a vast amount of my time doing that, but we also have other individuals. We've got an individual in Indianapolis, uh, covering that market. And we've got another, uh, gentleman who heads up our governmental uh, relations because we're GSA, uh, have a GSA certification. So we go and bid on a lot of government projects and we're doing a very cool project for the U S copyright and patent office right now, an animated piece. So, you know, we're, we're getting into a lot of different areas. I know that's a headache on the front end to get certified in that way, but man, what do I imagine? It's probably been a benefit once you're in the system. That's gotta be a lot of cool projects. So I've got, uh, just a quick, interesting question. I'm curious, personally, for both of you, your job is in media is to stay up to date with, you know, how people are engaging. How do you both individually 
keep up with things? Are you like what? I don't need to know your full morning routine by any means, but are you guys like scrolling TikTok at times? Are you subscribing to newsletters? Like, how do you guys keep up? I, I mean, I think of, again, like my parents, they're on it. I had to walk my dad through the other day, like how to post something to stories versus like Instagram posts. And I would imagine you guys can't be caught not understanding the difference between those. So I'm just curious from a personal perspective. How do you guys stay stay up to date on things? I would love for both of you guys to answer that if you can't. Well, I'll tell you what, Liz, five years ago, I thought snackable content was a bag of Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I had to ramp up my, my knowledge fairly quickly. So, um, I, I am really, really fortunate. Of course, I, I read periodicals, industry periodicals, but my greatest resource, um, are the people who work for me and, you know, and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not too proud to go to them and say, Mandy, Mandy will get a kick out of this. Um, you know, we, we were having to do EPKs for uh, relative justice. And I'm like, e EPK, EPK, what the heck is an EPK? So <laughs> my greatest resource are, are my, my team members and they, they keep me current. They keep me honest. My well, likewise, uh, we've got, you know, very talented people in the in the building. But personally, mine is three teenagers and a preteen in my house. <laughs> and so if I don't know, I really look old. So uh, in terms of that, but in terms of industry news, uh, yes, I mean, my inbox every morning is just inundated uh, with things specific to, you know, video production, media uh, and, and then sports again for me. So. Yeah, I spend my mornings hitting that pretty hard and then, you know, picking up the phone after that when, <laughs> when I know the person that the article's about. Fair enough. Um, so I have one last innovation related question and then we'll, I'll kind of take us home. Um, so on that note, how for employees who have ideas, Ms. D, I think you're giving a lot of um, great credit to to the people who work for you. How if, if employees have a new idea or a new tech or a new platform that's coming up, how do those ideas or, or new things get bubbled up from sort of like a what what is innovation infrastructure? Do you guys have anything like that? Is it a pretty organic process? If someone has an idea or like, oh, my gosh, this new thing Clubhouse just came out. We should look at it. How does that bubble up to the top? I think one of the. Um, values of being still a relatively small company is that we are able to still have a, a great deal of collaboration and communication. And it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm looking forward to everybody getting back into um, our, our offices, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later um, because we have a, a couple of rooms that have chalkboards and or whiteboards and people are able, the producers, um, our content creators can get together and spitball ideas and, you know, and get on the, the whiteboard and just share creative ideas. We've been able to do that um, through scheduled Zoom calls, of course, but I think David, you'll agree with me that Nothing is is better than when people are, you know, eye to eye, shoulder to shoulder, you know, and and just that creative electricity is going through a room. So, um, it, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to getting back in the office and um, hitting those whiteboards again. David, well, any other thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I would just say that that Mizzy has has fostered a very um, open environment in terms of there is no idea that won't be considered. Obviously that TV show was no small undertaking. Um, there are other things that we've done that we've considered. Uh, and it's not always an investment in, in, in finances, it's an investment in time and energy. And we spend a lot of time taking swings that we don't necessarily get a hit, but we know that eventually you know, you're going to, if you hit 300, you get in the hall of fame. Right. So we just want to take as many, as many swings and at bats as we can. That's, that's innovation summarized right there. So we, we could probably send on that. So uh, last thing I want to give you guys the opportunity, how can people get involved with Wrigley Media? I'll brag on a few things for you guys. Um, the stand-in 
with Drew Marymore on Netflix. I watched it. Would recommend it. Um, you guys, it sounds like had a had a had a big part in that. Um, obviously, we've talked about relative justice, uh, which it sounds like not only can people view but can be a part of that show lo- locally, as I understand. Um, but what are other ways that you would like for people to engage with Wrigley, or ways that they can support you or reach out to you guys? Ms. Yale, I'll let you start. Oh gosh. Well, just to uh, continue on the some of the great projects we've been involved in, I'm very happy to say that our program, um, uh, Escape to the Chateau, is now the number one rated program across all cable on Saturday nights. And then there's another great program on Circle Network called uh, Top 10 Country Countdown, which the audience can literally get involved in um, as they count down the, the top 10 country, greatest country, female stars of all time, top 10. One of my favorite episodes was top 10 country hairdos of all times. <laughs> and people can engage on social media and say, oh, the panelists got it all wrong. And um, so that's that's a, a fun program. But um, it, to get personally involved, I'm, I'm very, very proud of our team who has created, um, we've created a very, very robust internship program working not only through UK, um, but, you know, we realized as a company that we need to reach out to younger people um, uh, as they're deciding what their careers are going to be and and, um, expose them to to media. So we actually um, did an internship program um, where we had uh, college students and one high school student create a, a pitch for us and you know and and our team members helped those kids you know walk them through the the process of of what it's you know going to look like and um i I've, I've got to say it, these students were great I, i'm not going to lose track of them because they're going to be future employees of Wrigley Media i would add one plug if i may so if you even if you don't want to sue your uncle um, <laughs> you can still you can still sit in the gallery which i do I have to say i texted my siblings when i read that on the website and i sent them a screenshot and i said don't don't cross me because i now have i now have retribution options so that's, Sorry, right, David, right. that's right but for those that i mean it's such an interesting thing to see a, a you know a top notch uh, production being being done so i would encourage anybody that would want to go sit in and see a couple cases you can go for a half a day and go for a whole day you get a couple bucks to do it and it's at relativejustice.tv if you scroll to the very bottom you can see the schedule and you can go sit in the gallery and you will be on national television i'm we might do a team outing or something like that that would be I actually really like that idea. I really like that idea. Well, David, Mizzy, thank you guys so much. This has been an absolute pleasure, and I appreciate you guys getting into some of the details as well. Um, one of my greatest hopes is, A, that more and more people hear about you, know about you guys, and, and not only that, but are proud of the work that you guys are doing here in Lexington. I love hearing from both of you just how much you guys love Kentucky, um, love the area, and this is the kind of innovative energy that we're that we're looking to build and, and highlight in the region. So thanks for giving us your time. Um, And as I said, guys, head to their websites, engage with them, watch their stuff if you want to intern with them. I know we do have a lot of college students who listen to this podcast as well. So what what a great company to intern for at the beginning of your career. Um, So I will uh, I will obviously send you guys this episode once it's launched and we're very excited. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for having us, Liz. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you know someone who should be on our show, even if it's you, reach out to us at innovationincubated.com. And while you're on our website, sign up for our newsletter. Lastly, thanks to our sponsor, Apex Software. The right software partner can change everything. So reach out today at apexsoftware.com. Until next time, go team.